everyone. Welcome to this episode of the latest thread. Uh, this time we are going to talk about borders, not necessarily like border designs or, or anything like that. But I think um, myself anyways, I noticed that when you start to talk in any class about borders, everyone wants to know, you know, about the corners or how do you decide how you're going to place them to space them out or whatever. Um, so what we're going to do is just kind of share our favorite methods that we use to do that. Um, we kind of did some little drawings so that you can see what we mean, because I don't know how easy it would be to just Talk tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me see. I can share this. How big is that? <laughs> Can you see that? Uh -huh. Yep. Okay. So we just want to jump right into the first one. Sure. Okay. Sure. So we'll include this. Oh, that one's that's really it. tiny. Yeah. <laughs> so this one I drew up, and again, this was not about the design itself, but as to, you know, if you have a certain design in mind, how would you? place it so it's evenly spaced and i'm sure between the four of us we are gonna show you guys different ways but you know looking at this uh on this printable it was you know i thought well i'm just going to use the grid um which represents mm -hmm you know, the patchwork or the blocks. So I do like to do that on actual quilts that I look to see which is the best way. Well, how can I utilize what's already there in order to not have to do a ton of marking? So I just drew, you know, with the chop where you see the blue lines, you know, just extending from the patchwork or the grid. And so I knew exactly, you know, these are the parameters where I can place the design that I chose. Um, and then for this particular design, I subdivided the space where you see the blue uh, hash lines, you know, in order to execute the design. So, and then the border, I could have placed the same design again, but I chose to, choose something else um and so there you have it very simple utilizing the patchwork in order to make sure your design is spaced evenly do i need to add anything no, i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> but you also um like they're in the drawing in the corners, there's a 45 degree angle coming out from the corner to the inside there, right? That's good. Well, that was there. On it was there, but table. if it's not, then that's something that can be drawn in. Yes, you're exactly right. Because if you're doing a design like that, it's important, you know, where you turn your ruler, if you're using a ruler, I would normally draw that. You're, you're right, in order for the angles to be, or the stopping point to be meeting up. Mm -hmm. You turn your ruler. Yes, yes. And then, you know, in general, and I know my drawing doesn't reflect that totally because it's drawn on a screen that when you place your design, make sure you leave about half an inch on the outer edge for your binding so your design doesn't get cut off. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was a really small. <laughs> Sorry, it's how okay. it's safe. That's okay. So this one's mine. Um, and I do this a lot because I don't want to have to do any math at all. So if you notice on the left, that little yellow dotted line. So I just, you just need to mark that because that's where you're going to start the top border. And so I just stitch it from that point and run it off the edge, whatever it is. I mean, I do it with feather. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, I start right there, run it off the edge. 
and then do the same thing. So it's kind of like set up like a log cabin block, right? Not a log cabin, but a, a woven kind of thing. And then you never have to worry about what's going to happen where they meet because they don't meet. And when it's something like this is pretty structured, I guess. So if it's feathers up there where that dotted line is, you can kind of just make those feathers coming up go into the previous previous row to kind of blend if you want to do that. But yeah, I love this because there's no no math. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely easy. How do you handle that though? If it's a specific directional this sign, you know, then it. Well, my borders like always travel this clockwise. Clockwise. Okay. I don't know why. I know a lot of people do them always the other direction. So that one would be flowing off, this one off, that one off, you know, all clockwise for me. Yeah. I do clockwise too, because then I don't ever have to think. We're always mm -hmm. going clockwise. Right. You're just going that way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, this one is mine. And I also do no math marking because it's just too much. And um, there's an odd number of blocks in this quilt. So what I do is um, I mark my halves first. And when I say half, I usually start at the half of the quilt body, not the border. So that's that the blue lines. So I'll fold my quilt together from the corner of piece block to corner piece block and mark the center in my border. And then I fold that in half again and I mark another half. So that's the blue lines. So then I come in with this really handy tool that I have, which is called an expanding sewing gauge, which was made for buttonholes. So if you want to show that picture, Sharon, and then we'll come back. Yeah, I'm just not sure if it's the next one. Yeah, and it is. Okay. So this is an expanding sewing gauge and you can see, I'm, I have it offset on the right only because it was a different design. It's just a picture I had, but you can make it any shape you want to get the number of spaces you want between those two marked lines. Um, because I, I cannot figure out what half of 13 and nine sixteenths is. Mm -hmm. It's just, I don't need to know that. Okay, I just put down my <laughs> expanding sewing gauge and go, oh, four fit in here nicely. So we'll, and, um, the only thing about the expanding sewing gauge is once you get it to the size you want, don't move it because then you have to do it again. Mm -hmm. So then if you want to go back to the other picture. So that's what the green lines are. So you can see between the two blue lines, I marked three green lines. So that way I know where my designs are going to land on those green lines. And then I take my sewing gauge and I tilt it to the corner and I mark anything I need to mark in the corner just so it matches the rest of the border. And that's it, no math. So I understand what you were talking about in regards to the spacing being equal as you know how you did that. But um, I'm looking to see because you used all those colors. So were your purple? The purple is just what I was pretending to stitch. Right, but when those come down, they're not necessarily um, equally spaced in between the seams of the, the patchwork, right? You didn't worry about that. I don't worry about the patchwork. Mm -mm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if it were even, I think there were seven blocks on this. Yeah, if it were like eight blocks across, then I could easily use the seams of, of the patchwork. Mm. Well, so this is especially helpful if there's a blocks and then an inner border mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. changes the size of the outer border because now it's not the same proportionate to the blocks anymore, right? Yeah. Interesting. That works. Yeah. I, um, well, there's our expanding gauge. Mm -hmm. And then I actually do... Um, brought that, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget to mention it, like Karen, you were just saying that there's seven blocks. And so that's one of the things that I always think about is, do I have an odd number of spaces or an even number of spaces? Because that's gonna affect mm -hmm. how you plan your design out. So on the bottom, for example, if I were to just go with the piecing of the blocks, I could put a feather spine, uh, low, high, low, high curves and have it meet the same in the corners, but with an even amount of spacing. So if I split that space in half, 
and I have double amount of sections, now I have an even number. So that means I have to treat the borders differently or somehow meet in the middle a little bit differently so that um, the, the design is balanced at least. It's not doing an OD curve when you're trying to do it or an any curve when you're trying to do an OD curve in the corner kind of thing. Um, and I also wrote this down so I wouldn't forget. Ava mentioned it already too, leaving a quarter inch or up to a half an inch away for the binding. If you're doing like piano keys or something, that's not an issue. You can go right off the edge. But if you're doing something that you don't want to be cut off under the binding, like a feather or, you know, um, any one of these designs that were shown already, then you definitely want to leave that space in between so that your tips of your design isn't, isn't chopped off. And that's weird because when I quilt, I do it instinctively. But when I draw, I draw right to the edge. I yeah. don't know. Right. <laughs> Like my I actually mark it. <laughs> I'll mark it in a disappearing pen or, or a water soluble pen. I'll mark that so that I don't forget because I will tend to just fill that whole space. Yeah. Well, I think too, a lot of times I'll do it. it and it, especially on my own quilt. So I'll do something like you said, Sharon, with the piano keys, not necessarily that, but even if it's like one-sided feathers, you know how sometimes mm -hmm. you go, just one side I'll do it from the edge so that I don't have to worry about you yep. know that and I can travel around the edge instead of in the seam but all our little cheater ways <laughs> plus it's I easier have a customer that likes to add double by uh piping after the fact you know and so by the time she squares it up she never knows exactly where she wants to place that so that makes it tr tricky for choosing border designs because she also loves feathers. Mm -hmm. So I have to move it way in and then add usually like quarter inch little tiny piano keys, you know, with enough space for a couple inches so she can, you know, cut it wherever she wants to without, you know, cutting into the feathers themselves, so. Right, and then if she does it further away, then there's not this big weird gap in exactly the, right yeah for sure yeah and i think once you're at the machine like to me it becomes automatic eventually you just stop you know before you can visually see where you need to stop on that edge yeah. in the beginning not so much but you know mm. yeah but the math sucks are a full like all over background, then you can put them anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The expanding so engaged certainly changed things for me because like you said, I, I mean, I was always trying to do the math and then just round up or down to the nearest bigger number. And uh, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Especially when you have like that quilt that we, you have the picture of the, with the border it's even with, there's no board, there's no inner border, but as soon as you add an inner border, even if it's a half inch or an inch, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're so handy. So if you had a quilt that you were going to, let's say like, you know how some people get carried away. They're just trying to make a figure, right? You have a border and then a little border and another border. So usually if it's me and I have like three like that, I'll do something different in that little or one in the middle. But would you carry that through? You know what I mean? It'd probably be the easiest to just use that gauge to mark it through that inner mm -hmm. one and the outer one at the yeah. same time. Yeah. It again, it, it all depends how much I'm getting paid. But, <laughs> 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 but usually, yeah, if I'm just going to mark my border, it's just one straight chalk line, no matter how many borders there are, because that keeps my brain mm -hmm. structured, I guess. If there's like multiple little borders and you don't want to always do something different in every single border. Right. Like how we drew out, I think almost all of us drew out like a center halfway, like a mid width point on it. You could use one of those seams as a midpoint between, even if the borders were uneven, like one was oh, six yeah. inches and one was four inches, you could still use that seam as a feather spine or at some other registration point that you could build a design off of and just use that as a, a marking point and have the design fill two border spaces instead of one. 
Oh yeah. Or sorry, uh, one border, one whole space instead of two opposite. Right, and you know, that's probably the most economical way to do it, but then it boggles my mind when you look at the color schemes of these different borders, you know you have to go with something fairly simple because there's such a high contrast in color between the two outer borders that it, you know, it'll look like it's, well, it doesn't look good. So if you do something like piano keys, then it's less noticeable. Yeah. So I had a funny guys, story. Oh, go ahead. You I go had ahead. a border story because I had this beautiful quilt and then she did um, prairie points between the inner border and the outer border. And I'm designing my plan. It's wonderful. It's going to come in. It was, I think it was arcs. And I get all the way down to the bottom and I'm like, what's going on? Why is this not landing right? Because this side had 72 prairie points and this side had 73 prairie points. Oh. Mm. So yeah, I had to rip out the whole thing that was done. So now whenever I get prairie points like that, that I want to put a design behind, I count all the prairie points to make sure they match. Yeah. So. I had one where I, I mean, I, you know, you look at the quilt, I'm not inspecting the quilt. It, it, you know, here's the border. It was the same on the top and the sides. And I'm looking at it. Yeah, I'm going to do this. And I did it same thing all the way down there. And I got to the bottom. I'm like, why does this not even fit? <laughs> it's not the same size. So I just, I wasn't ripping it out. So I just kind of made it smaller and made it work. But when I asked her, she's like, well, I read, that's all the fabric I had left when I got to that. <laughs> I'm like, great. Yeah, I mean, you should have told me that they weren't the same. <laughs> No. So, so do you guys quilt your borders first or last or where in your order of stitching do you that end? really depends if i don't know what i'm going to put i want to see what's you know how the designs evolve in the body of the quilt also if i'm doing an all feather border because i do the feathers simultaneously on both sides then I will do them last. So I don't keep stopping when I'm rolling and losing my flow. You can just so keep going. always do it last. If mm -hmm. it's a structured border where I'm drawing out a lot of, you know, designs, then I'll mm -hmm. stitch that first and save all the fun stuff for later, all the fills and feathers. But yeah, if I'm just doing a straight around board, a feather border, Wherever I, wherever I get done quilting that, I put my needle down, I start my feathers and I go all the way around. And it's great if you can bribe somebody to stand at the end. So you stitch and you're like, roll, stitch, roll. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do for the binding. When we sew binding on a quilt. Yes. You so just want somebody to stand there. <laughs> stand out of the end. Okay, roll. Buzz. <laughs> you get it done super quick. <laughs> yeah. I like to decide on ones that I know I can stop and start as I go. Mm -hmm. So I do the top and then I do them <clears throat> as I roll every one. Cause I like to get to the bottom and when I see the bottom, it comes off. Not, you know, Back I don't revisit it <laughs> again. Yeah. But definitely no turning. Just keep going. Never. No, no turning. I turn all the time. Ugh. No, see, I hate loading. So by the time I'm unloading, there's no way I'm putting that quilt back on there again. I guess I guess the more you do something, the faster, the more efficient you get, or you better. Do you turn that. because you're using the Stadler or because? No, I don't. Too? No, no, I I turn well because the Stadler you can still do your designs down the side without having to turn. Yeah, but, but a lot of people don't like the chunking, so they they rather turn. Yeah, so if I have a design that um, I have a lot of marking to do, like, so here's one of the things that I think about too, is if I have any ruler work, is it when you're quilting up the side of a border and you're maybe you're doing a piano key or whatever, when you're looking right down on your ruler or your design, it's balanced and everything's proportionate, but the further you away your ruler gets and your stitching your needle gets away from you, your perspective changes a little bit. So mm -hmm. your quarter inch piano keys or your half inch piano keys, even if you're using the lines of the marker on the ruler, you're still seeing them at a different angle a little bit. So 
it can change as it gets away from you. So I, I, I mean, I just like to do it, yeah. especially if I've got tons of marking and then I can just do it all in one swoop. To me, it's faster than stopping and starting constantly. Yeah. Well, if you mentioned piano keys, you know, the, I like to do the piano keys from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. And so I don't find it necessary to, to have to turn it for that design. But we all do things differently. And I do think it depends for some people on what the design is and they feel more comfortable. Like I said, with the feathers, you know, you kind of can see, you know, when you stop in order to turn to so some people rather, you know, turn it. And it, you're right, it's not, it's not really very time consuming, but, you know, if it's a big quilt, every time you want to turn it, you know, you have chances of getting puckers if you're not, especially now, you know, you're towards the end, so you want to rush. So. so what you were saying with that perspective thing, when you're looking through the ruler, Sharon, I, I, I learned that a long time ago and I have like this little method where as I'm pushing it up now, I know I should see a, a hair of fabric. Mm -hmm. Now I know I should yep. see two hairs of fabric until I can get yeah. too far to reach. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you, there's ways you can balance, you know, split the difference using your eyes. Right. But for me, it's just much, I don't know, it's a personal thing. I definitely yeah. like to be able to turn it and like plan that whole section, especially if I'm going to use the expanding sewing gauge, I can mark all of the sections instead of, is this going to work out by the time I get to the top? You know, oh, place it no, if, I'm, if I'm chopping the border, those lines are already on there before I load it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas I mark everything when it's on the frame. So yeah. yeah. Cause even piano keys, I would mark, I mark them. So you know, because usually they're to suck up something, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and they usually don't ever fit in there evenly. So I want to see it, how I can, yeah. you know, fudge in there a little fudge bit. It. And then I don't even look at any markings on the ruler because I'm just stitching a line that's yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Which I can't yeah, resist takes... on, on Jody's method, but now I'm conforming. It works. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so many ways to do things and that's whatever works for, for everyone. Yeah. And some people love math and if you do good for you, <laughs> but I can't do it. No. So it's not my way, I guess. Yeah. I'm going to quilt, not math. That's definitely a left brain thing. And if you have to pull your calculator. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> no, my first thought is there's got to be another way to do okay. this. The only time I pull my calculator is when I'm doing up the bill. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do any math otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. Okay. So um, if you guys have any methods that you use that, you know, you love and you think make things much easier, we'd love for you to share those. Um and we hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.